Atlas orbit earlier this year. Commercial Breaks now reports on the staging of that operation and the high-risk business of satellite insurance. This is the story of two worlds, the world of highly sophisticated space technology and another world 3,000 miles away where they still use a quill pen. Lloyds of London carries most of the risk of those multi-million dollar space shots going wrong. On February the 3rd of this year, the crew of the American Space Shuttle prepared to launch a communication satellite owned by Western Union. It was called Westar 6. It was insured for over $100 million. At first, everything looked fine. Crew member Bruce McCandless. The deployment was flawless, and we were confident that everything had gone well. It wasn't until several hours later when we got a query from the control center in Houston began to realize that perhaps something had gone awry. Despite this, the second satellite, Palapa B, belonging to the Indonesians, was launched three days later. It was insured for $75 million. This time, the shuttle crew decided to film what happened as the motor fired. When the motor lit exactly 45 minutes later, we found we had a, a little white light, which we rapidly centered in the TV camera. We got a great big luminous smoke ring that expanded out and we interpreted that as some sort of a failure in the nozzle. The little white light is fading because the motor has died. It's thought that the fault lies in the black cone at the bottom of the motor. It may have disintegrated. Instead of being in a very high circular orbit, because of that motor failure, the satellites are now in a useless elliptical orbit. They're both functioning, but because they're on the wrong track, they can't do their job. They're just so much space junk which looked like costing the insurers $180 million, the greatest space insurance loss ever. At Lloyd's, space insurance is now a dirty word. The underwriters have paid out twice as much as they've received. And for each of the two satellites, the major loss is suffered by its lead underwriter. One of them, Stephen Merritt, has $7.5 million at stake on Palapa B. It's a communication satellite which was to have been stationed high over Indonesia. High over North America was the planned location for the other satellite, West Star 6. The lead underwriter on this one is Richard Malam. His share of West Star 6 is $3 million. But the two leads reacted differently to their losses. Richard Malam paid up. Uh, uh, as per our policy wordings and conditions, um, we paid in accordance with those conditions at the right and proper time and uh, the fact that merit hasn't paid uh, may, has no effect on us at all. Stephen Merritt hasn't paid because he wants to do something imaginatively different, something that has never been done before. In fact, nobody is sure whether it's even possible. He wants to stage a rescue in space. What we intend to do is to get a shuttle up to a, a place in space where the satellite can be brought, uh, the satellite then be loaded onto the shuttle, brought down, refurbished by Hughes, made in a condition where it's effectively as good as new, and then it can be relaunched, and the Indonesians will have their satellite in working order. It's a bold and global plan. First, he must persuade the Indonesians not to claim their insurance money so that he can use it to finance the rescue and start building a replacement satellite. But why should they? The Indonesians, according to, to the plan, if it works out, they will actually get a usable satellite in orbit about a year earlier than they could otherwise achieve it. Next, he must persuade NASA to use one of the shuttles to bring the satellite down. But what's in it for them? NASA need to demonstrate how, how the shuttle can be used for recovery. Um, clearly, internationally, that will have political significance to them. They also want to demonstrate it to themselves for their own um, confidence and so forth. Then he must get the satellite manufacturers, Hughes, to build special rescue equipment and to refurbish the satellite once it's down. 
Once again, why should they? Hughes, um, two things. One is that it helps to protect their reputation. The other thing is that it would demonstrate that they are the best uh, manufacturer of satellites and have the greatest care of their product. Um, and, and I think that it has very considerable um, value to them as, as part of their general pride uh, of the way they do business. But Merritt's biggest hurdle will be his own colleagues. They'll have to foot the bill if the rescue fails. He's got an answer for them too. If we do nothing now, then the satellites are total loss and they have a full claim under their policy. There's no question about that at all. Uh, if we can go through in conjunction with the Indonesians and with NASA and Hughes with this recovery exercise, then there's a very good chance uh, that there will be some sort of saving. How many millions of dollars will actually be saved is anybody's guess, but it doesn't take many millions of dollars to be saved to make it worthwhile doing. It's the kind of gamble that Lloyd's underwriters have been taking for 300 years. It was in the 1680s that Edward Lloyd set up his coffee house in the city of London, where merchants and ship owners dabbled in insuring each other's cargoes as a business sideline. Lloyd's like to remember that they've been around for a long time. In those days, they met at coffee house tables on bench seats facing each other. This design is echoed in today's underwriters' boxes. They've even kept the waiters, but now their job is to announce the brokers. The general public are not allowed on the floor at Lloyd's. If you want to insure something, first get yourself a broker. And whether it's film stars' legs or jumbo jets, the broker then approaches the underwriter who specialises in that kind of risk. Well, we can talk some more about... Richard Malam is an aviation underwriter. Here he's being asked to take part of the risk on a group of American commuter airlines. There are now definitely 27 aircraft, all of which are named there. 13 DC-9s and... Uh, and the rest wire 11s, yeah. yeah. There are no committee decisions. Each underwriter uses his own skill and judgment to decide whether he'll accept the risk or not. But when things go wrong, it's not only the underwriter who has to pay out. Most of the loss falls on their backers, who never come near Lloyd's. Ken Hicks is a backer. He's a landowner in the south of England. To become a member of Lloyd's, he has to show personal wealth of at least £100,000. His stake in Lloyd's brings him in a comfortable income, but the potential risks are chilling. If one's a member of Lloyd's, uh, one's liable to lose absolutely everything that one possesses. Uh, your home, your farm, your cars, your clothes, uh, your liable right down to your last shirt button. Not just the amount of money that you have invested in Lloyd's, but absolutely everything. But it's unlikely that will happen. Ken Hicks's syndicate insured part of the $100 million West Star satellite. But the risk is spread so wide that Hicks will lose less than 100 pounds. Once a year, Ken Hicks makes his way to the city of London for a special evening. He's in rich company. It's wealthy people like this that back Lloyd's insurance. His fellow diners are all members of the same group of Lloyd's syndicates. They're a very cautious group. They pride themselves on having refused to insure the Titanic. The result, in the last 50 years, no member has been asked to pay. Tonight, they've all come along to hear how well they're doing. The aviation underwriter has made a profit, but he's had problems. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. 1982 produced a series of losses to the market of such size and frequency that it was, at year-end, fairly described as the worst year ever for aviation insurers. These losses included Air Florida, Pan Am, Spantax, and two satellites. At the end of 1983, we decided that we would not write any new space business until the rates rise. 
Unfortunately, this decision was not taken in time to avoid the West Star loss, but we did decline to write the Indonesian Palapa satellite, which failed to reach its correct orbit. Right, but the you. news of a possible rescue bid for the satellites has reached Ken Hicks. Mr. Brozovich, is Syndicate Knife 959 likely to be asked to put up any more money for this recovery? And if the answer to this should be yes, uh, are there uh, real chances of a profit coming to the Syndicate? The excitement of recovering the satellites is great. It's something we'd all like to be involved with. The reality of the situation, money, could mean that we finally elect not to attempt to recover either of the satellites. Our for this syndicate, space insurance is for the moment too risky. And in general, it's getting harder to insure satellites, as the French are about to find out. The European launcher Ariane is due to go up in July. This time it's a new version with two booster rockets at the bottom. These have been thoroughly tested on the ground, but never in flight. And on their very first launch, they'll be carrying an expensive payload, two satellites. The French telecom satellite is inside the black container. The ECS-2 on top of it has already been insured at Lloyd's. Should the Ariane rocket fail, both satellites might be lost. This accumulated risk worries many underwriters. Nevertheless, the French asked a broker, Chris Kevill, to go into this tough market to secure what insurance he could on the telecom satellite. On the 16th of May, he approached Eddie Sims, a lead underwriter. Janet, good morning. Eddie, good morning. Good morning. Um, <coughs> we've got the telecom business with us today. Sims had earlier insisted on a rate of 15% for the telecom, the highest ever for a satellite. The French rejected it, but failing to get insurance elsewhere, they're now forced to accept this rate. The remaining question is what Sims's line will be. That's Lloyd's language for how much of the risk he's willing to underwrite. What sort of line are you going to be able to... Uh... Well, uh, we can only write uh, 10 million francs. If that's your maximum, sir. That's, uh... Ten million francs wasn't a bad start, but Chris Kevill would have liked more. We're faced with a market that, after the Palapa and Westar um, mishaps at the beginning of the year, is slightly wary of the overall situation. Um, and we also have a capacity problem. That capacity problem, the accumulated risk of the two satellites on the same rocket, is going to be his biggest headache. Morning, Chris. How are you, sir? Richard, I'm well. How are you, sir? Good, fine. Thanks, sir. He approached Richard Malam, the man who got his fingers burnt on the West Star mishap. How do you today? What we've got, Richard, today is we've got the, think, the first launch since the um, Palapa West Star situation. This is the launch and the first 180 days, the initial in orbit cover. We're talking about sums insured of 355 million. Eddie Sims has let it off and we're talking about that as a rate. And what accumulation have we got? You, are, the other you will accumulate on the first one uh, with ECS-2. ECS-2, which we're on? Which you're on. And we've got 48 million on that placed in this market. Can we just check, see how much we've got on ES-2, Joe? One and a half million dollars. Yeah, we've got a very big line. Actually, I think because of that, because, we're, because of the accumulation factor, we're not going to write this one. Richard, I think we're going to find that problem all the way around the market. So what I'd, what I'd say to you is, look, please, can you write us, um, say, a third of your line on ECS? Because it's, this is a very good write. Because of the current market I, situation, we've I'm, got better terms on this. First of all, I'm not greatly in love with Ariane as a launch vehicle. This is a tried and tested satellite. It is a derivative of the ECS, the European Space yeah. Satellite, which to date has been successful for you. What I'd like you to do is to say, write us three quarters of a million, half your line on the other one. But what you'd like me to do, what I'm actually going to do, are going to be two different things. I'm afraid I'm <laughs> fully accumulated. Yeah. I've got a, f a full line on ECSB. I don't want to write any more on this particular launch. There's well, no way say that we can put down a half a million line. I yeah. cannot subject my names and my syndicate to a line bigger than I feel we should write on this particular launch. And I think we've got the maximum line 
on the other satellite. Oh, yes, but you've got, you've any, I mean, your accumulation is purely on the launch vehicle, which is 18 minutes worth of exposure. The uh -huh. other 180 days, you've got no accumulation. What happened to the first two Ariane launches? They weren't uh, insured for a considerable amount. What happened to them? Uh? What happened to them? <laughs> huh? yeah. But hell, this is, a, this is the L10, this is the Ariane 3. Yeah. Huh? Okay, and we, this is a very. Yeah, but the first, well, they've had, they've had a failure, failure rate of two out of five, haven't they? The no. pretty high well, failure rate. Space feels progress, which The thing is, it's not as if we're totally against area. I mean, I, we've, we've written a oh, line. Totally against we've written a line on this You're, particular yeah. launch on another satellite, yeah. to you. Oh, no. And I'm not prepared to write any more on it. Come on, you can write us half a million. You're a very, you're a very good broker, uh, Chris, but I'm afraid the answer, it's no. it's uh, the answer is negative. The answer is There is some way that you can put a line on no, it for us. No, I've got my full line on that particular launch. Thank you very much. So you have to seek it out, seek capacity elsewhere. Okay, Richard. Despite his best efforts, Chris Kevill only managed to get 25% cover at Lloyd's. In this atmosphere of disenchantment with space insurance, it might seem hard for Stephen Merritt to promote his satellite rescue plan. But luckily, the plan gets a boost from space itself. NASA demonstrates that it's possible to capture a satellite, the ailing Solar Max, and to repair it in space. Stephen Merritt was quick to exploit this. What we have for you here today are a series of film clips of the actual Solar Max recovery itself. And it shows Delbert Smith, Merritt's American lawyer, has been flown over, armed with videotape, to promote the rescue plan with the underwriters. The Solar Max was the beginning of what we're talking about today, and that is the much easier, the much more technologically simpler task of the recovery of a straightforward, simple satellite. A possible rescue bid would employ similar techniques and the underwriters are told how they could be used on Palapa B. You here see the astronaut with his attached fixture going up to the satellite. The attached fixture will be attached onto the antenna support bracket, which is one of the main brackets... They're also given a rough idea of costs. What's their reaction to all this? Stephen Merrick came out of the meeting to tell us. Their reaction was um, a certain amount of surprise, a certain amount of confusion. But at the end, uh, there was almost complete unanimity, unanimity to go ahead with it. So it's a breakthrough. The underwriters have given him the go-ahead, but on condition that he gets an acceptable price from the Americans. The Americans, in their turn, suggest that it would be cheaper to rescue both satellites. It adds up. For building special equipment, Hughes want $2.5 million for one and $5 million for two. For the actual rescue, NASA want 4.7 million for one, but only 5.5 million for two, making a total rescue price of $7.2 million for one satellite or $10.5 million for both. The potential saving to the underwriters might be as high as $30 million for one and $60 million for both. The choice is obvious. Risk 10.5 and, and you could save 60. Stephen Merritt wants to go ahead and ask broker John Howes to persuade the underwriters to put up that ten and a half million dollars, which of course they lose if the rescue fails. John, how are you? Fine, thank you. This I'm is... not too sure I want to see you. You always cost me money when you come in. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this is the, uh, re the uh, recovery sheet that we are going to put around the market for the B2 satellite. These seem rather more reasonable than ones that were being mooted recently. Yes, I, th I, th I think they are because I think it's a... they are the double pickup figures uh, for West R6 as well. So fishing for two is cheaper than fishing for one, really? That's right. OK. I said you always cost me money when certainly, you come in. Certainly. Thank you for all the work you've done in the matter. I know it's been a long uphill slog yeah. for you. Well, I just hope it works. It's very interesting. OK. Thank you. <laughs> See you. Elsewhere, John Howes meets more restraint. Fine. Well, I've been into all this with Mr Merritt, but can you tell me how many underwriters have agreed to this and how many have disagreed? Uh, at the present time we're going around the market, as you mm. see, there are a number of initials there. Well, there are not a, many, are there? No, there are, but there, is a, uh, photo, there are three photos stats in the market being taken around by uh, my colleagues, mm. and um, it is being agreed to. I think at the end of the day, you're probably going to come up with something like a, an 85% 
agreement. And what happens to the other 15 uh, percent? That is going to be referred back to certain underwriters who feel that they could take more of this. And who are the underwriters going to take the additional gamble? Don't know yet. We don't know yet. No, some, no. some of them. I, I think Mr. Merritt is, is prepared to take right. some of it. Stephen Merritt can only pick up so much. So it's obviously important to get as many underwriters as possible to go along with him. I see. Well, we, we've had various meetings on this, I, and I certainly have agreed to follow Stephen Merritt on this. So um, I just admit it. Okay. Thank you very much. And keep your fingers crossed. Right. Calling for me. I've never written a satellite in my life, and of course I've got. You've, inherit, with you've inherited it. it. I've inherited yes. it. Yeah. With the underwriters beginning to go along with the idea, Stephen Merritt goes to NASA headquarters in Washington. Could I express our thanks to NASA for? Uh, enabling us He's to come here to brief the Indonesians on the preparations for the rescue. We shall, after lunch, get down to uh, discussing uh, the basic um, sense and possibilities. But as he talks, it becomes apparent that they've misread the Indonesians. The best way they want their money, and they're not interested in his rescue plans. To raise his money, Stephen Merritt will now have to go back to the underwriters. Back in London, there's another snag. If West Star 6 is rescued, Richard Malam believes that his group has a claim on the money. Well, we have rights of uh, recovery because under the policy we have Western Union, if the satellite is recovered and relaunched, we have entitlement of 50% of the revenue if it is relaunched successfully. So this is what the, uh, the discussion is about with Stephen Merritt at the moment. And Stephen Merritt, without giving ground, calls a meeting to sort it out. All the underwriters who lost money on the two satellites have been invited to attend. Richard Malam feels he has a strong claim and a strong card to play. If no agreement, if no agreement is reached, I doubt whether they can go ahead with the recovery of those two satellites. Because Western Union, the owner of Westar 6, are not prepared to release title of ownership to anybody unless there is agreement between the two sets of insurers. So somebody has to concede if the rescue is to take place. The two leads put their respective cases. Richard Malam argues that all those who'd lost money on the satellite should have a share of any income arising from resale. Stephen Merritt, who'd insured the revenue of the satellite, argues that the small print gives him and his colleagues a prior claim. Twenty minutes later, that group of underwriters left the meeting, along with Stephen Merritt. Yes, if you're not careful. What's the all, Merritt? Yeah. Well, we've left the Western Union primary underwriters to discuss amongst themselves what their position is. But Broadly speaking, we were encouraged by the enthusiastic support. Well, if you can call silence enthusiastic support. <laughs> Richard Malam and his fellow underwriters stay behind to discuss what they should do. Before the meeting, there'd even been talk of going to court. We believe that, that although there was a lot of uh, 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 talk and a lot of people were trying to see how much they could get out of us and twist our arms indeed that if actually pushed to the point of having to litigate for their for their share as they called it uh, they would step back and I'm every reason to suppose that that was a reasonable assessment of the <coughs> probabilities. Merritt was right it was Richard Malam and his group that had to concede. The only way this matter would have been solved would be in the courts and quite frankly we did not wish to go to court with another Lloyd's underwriter on a matter such as this. And we thought it would be bad for Lloyd's, uh, and um, quite frankly, we did not want to be seen to be stopping uh, an idea of recovering these satellites. So at last, the rescue was on, and by August, Stephen Merritt is at the manufacturers in California. Well, some He's won title to both satellites and is here representing the new owners, the underwriters of Lloyd's, to see how their money is being spent. Will one side of the, uh, the satellite be much hotter than the other, or would it have been spinning sufficiently recently? We're maybe as much as a 100 degree gradient between the two vehicles. And we will actually apply heaters to uh, 
This is where they're building new equipment to hold the satellites as they're brought down to Earth on board the shuttle. It's never been done before, and the equipment doesn't come cheap. This piece alone costs $200,000. By late August, another obstacle is overcome. After two months delay, the shuttle Discovery, which eventually will be used for the rescue, at last manages to get off the ground for the first time. It's carrying three satellites insured for a total of $240 million. All are launched successfully, much to the relief of Lloyd's. The November rescue date is looking better. The idea is that the remote manipulator arm of the shuttle will be used to grab the satellites. But they haven't been designed to be rescued, so there's nothing for it to grab hold of. This is where the astronauts come in with a rather strange piece of equipment. Astronaut Dale Gardner. We call it a, the, uh, an AKM capture device. A common name that we call it is a stinger. It's a long probe that sticks out in front of the MMU. And it's much like a molly bolt. I don't know if you have these over in Britain, but it's a, a bolt that you can put through a wall, and it has three fingers or two fingers that then pop on springs, such that you can then pull it back with the threads and attach something to the wall. We're going to do that same thing with the stinger. The point we're going to attack on the spacecraft is the rocket nozzle that has since been fired. NASA started to train the astronauts some time ago. Dale Gardner and Joe Allen will both go out to grab the satellite, and they've been practicing the procedure in the tank at Houston. As well as the shuttle, it's the cost of training these astronauts and developing that equipment that the underwriters have to pay for. The astronauts will have to steer that stinger into the only place that's rigid enough to take the grip, the motor nozzle. Using a model, the whole idea was explained to Stephen Merritt when he visited Houston and was shown how the astronauts would use the device. In reality, he'll be in a position about like so with his hands in this area with the hand controller. So he'll be flying, looking right down the point of the probe across this um, cross member here. And when he gets the probe in, just as he's about ready to touch the spacecraft, he'll pull this lever back. These toggles spring out, and then you coupled, soft docked, if you will, between the maneuvering unit, the stinger, and the spacecraft. So it can't get loose, even though it might um, you know, rattle around a little bit. You've got it captured. Manipulate arm comes On the side of the stinger, there's a grappling pin which the remote arm can grab. As the man who masterminded the space salvage, Stephen Merritt is being shown around mission control at the Johnson Space Center. And this is where he'll be during the rescue. This is our customer support room where you'll be located during the fight. Uh, we have in here all of the communications and uh, displays that you'll need to observe the operations. And uh, if you are here for the launch, uh, this is a typical of the place you would be sitting. Matter of fact, you might be at this table. And as it provides you with all of the communications that you need to follow uh, the progress of the flight. It's been a long haul for Stephen Merritt. To reduce his losses, he's moved from being just a Lloyd's underwriter into the riskier business of space salvage. How does he feel about that? Well, I'm somewhat reluctant, I think. We would prefer not to have got into this position. But seeing as we're in it, we're reasonably happy. As NASA prepares for the rescue, the stakes are high. The underwriters could save up to $60 million or throw away another $10 million. What are the chances? I'm very optimistic. I don't think anybody can be totally confident as it's uh, nothing approaching it has been done before, but I'm very optimistic that we shall have a successful outcome. This is shuttle launch control. 4,000, stand by. Okay, and I'm penalty to CBR on the left. CRT select switch should be one. Okay. Uh, 
Astronauts on board the American Space Shuttle Discovery have been successful in their effort to recapture a stranded communication satellite from space. The operation to recover the satellite Palapa is going ahead now, and it's the most difficult and dangerous task which the shuttle's crew of five have to perform on this mission. But now they've run into trouble because the satellite won't fit into the payload bay. Our space editor, Reg Turnell, is watching the shuttle's progress from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral and sent us this report. Joe Allen and Dale Gartner were in their spacesuits well ahead of time. And just above discovery, the Palapa satellite was spinning frighteningly fast. 300 kilometers above the Pacific, Joe set off rather like a metal oh, yeah. and locked himself onto the satellite. Anna Fisher on the flight deck told him what to do next. Okay, the wrench is broken over. Stop the clock. I've got Good work, right. cowboy. Joe told Anna as she grabbed the lapper and pulled it into the cargo bay. Then Dale Gardner used a pair of clippers bought in a Houston hardware saw store to saw the lapper's antenna. But then came trouble. So far, the arrangements for stowing it in the cargo bay just now won't work, the, uh, and the spacewalkers are in a lot of trouble. They seem to be getting very tired and may need another spacewalk to finish the job tomorrow. Well, out of the vast country of India, where millions of pupils... ...from the Space Shuttle Discovery worked all afternoon to capture a communication satellite which went astray in February. Our science correspondent James Wilkinson reports. The first part of the rescue went well. The crippled Palapa satellite was spinning slowly as the shuttle approached. Joe Allen set out from the payload bay with a six-foot contraption called a stinger strapped in front of him. As he disappeared behind the satellite for the rendezvous, he had one complaint. The sun was in his eyes. But he managed to insert the stinger into the satellite's engine nozzle and locked onto it. Using the jet thrusters on his backpack, he stopped the satellite spinning. The remote-controlled arm then latched onto the stinger and pulled the satellite towards the shuttle. Then things went wrong. As this animation shows, a bracket should have been fixed onto the other end of the satellite so the arm could lure it into the cradle. But the bracket... So the astronauts have been trying to manhandle the satellite into the payload bay. A short while ago, the astronauts reported that they have satellite berthed. But NASA are still holding their breath. They've got to do the same thing all over again with a second satellite on Wednesday. Rescues in space. The inhabitants of one of Britain's most remote communities, the... Allen, flying free from the shuttle Discovery, recaptured the satellite, which went astray last February, and guided it back aboard. The operation was closely watched by the insurance underwriters Lloyds, who are paying NASA £10 million to rescue two satellites that went astray. The syndicates are hoping to resell them to recoup some of the £144 million they paid out. Lawrence McGinty has been watching the pictures here in London. Astronauts Joe Allen and Dale Gardner carried some bizarre equipment on today's rescue mission. Allen, floating free and wearing a space scooter on his back, wielded an instrument called a stinger, a kind of space fishing rod, to hook the Palapa satellite, which had been in the wrong orbit since it was launched by a space shuttle last February. While his colleague Gardner waited in the space shuttle's payload bay, Allen used the jets on his backpack to fly across to Palapa. As the morning sun flooded his spacesuit with light, he had a view of Detroit 200 miles below that few Americans have seen before. NASA had moved Palapa's orbit so the shuttle could catch up with it after a chase through space of one and a half million miles. Allen and Gardner hoped to become the first astronauts ever to hook a satellite and bring it back to Earth in the payload bay. Lloyds paid out 70 million pounds in insurance to the Indonesian government who owned Palapa and hoped to recover some of that outlay by repairing the satellite on Earth and selling what will probably be the world's first second-hand satellite. But first, Allen had to dock with Palapa. And obstruct the toggle. Stop dock, stop dock. He'd done it. The stinger had penetrated the exhaust of Palapa's jet booster. The end of the stinger opened out like an umbrella and gripped the satellite so well, Alan could swing it round as easily as a baseball bat. Their next job was to inch Palapa into the payload bay. 
1,500 pounds of communication satellite swinging free in space. It all seemed to prove the point that man in space can be almost as at home as a fish in water. No doubt a point NASA will exploit in its arguments to get the finance for a space station. But once the astronauts had removed the stinger that Allen had used to hook the satellite, there was, in NASA's words, a technical problem. The astronauts couldn't attach a clamp onto the satellite to allow the remote control arm to grasp the lapper. They improvised, one holding the satellite, the other attaching an adapter ring to lock the satellite in place in the hold. A few minutes ago, I spoke to Lloyd's underwriter, Stephen Merritt, at NASA in Houston. I feel enormously relieved because there was a, um, a real uh, difficulty um, with an unexpected uh, piece of equipment and the uh, skill and the determination of the astronauts uh, enabled them to, to uh, use the contingency plans and, and the satellite has been successfully secured. What exactly was the problem? The shape of the, of the um, aerial, what you might describe as the lid on the top of the dustbin, um, was not exactly as expected and therefore the uh, clamping arrangements couldn't be made as intended. Therefore, they had to effectively manipulate the satellite by hand. Uh, and, and that was, they had a, a contingency plan for it, and, and uh, they put that into, into effect, and it worked out. One of the changes the Chancellor announced in his package was the scrap... Astronauts from the shuttle Discovery worked all afternoon to capture a communications satellite which went astray in February. Our science correspondent James Wilkinson reports. The first part of the rescue went well. The crippled Palapa satellite was spinning slowly as the shuttle approached. Joe Allen set out from the payload bay with a six-foot contraption called a stinger strapped in front of him. As he disappeared behind the satellite for the rendezvous, he had one complaint. The sun was in his eyes. But he managed to insert the probe into the satellite's engine nozzle and locked onto it. Using the jet thrusters on his backpack, he stopped the satellite spinning. The remote-controlled arm latched onto the stinger and pulled the satellite towards the payload bay. Then problems. The astronauts couldn't use the arm to lower the satellite into its cradle in the payload bay. Instead, they had to manhandle it into its berth. One false move and it could have swung against the shuttle, perhaps damaging it. An adapter was bolted on. So far, so good, but NASA are still holding their breath. They've got to do it all over again with a second satellite on Wednesday. Police in the Irish Republic are still searching for Evelyn Glenholm. Astronauts aboard the American Space Shuttle Discovery achieved two space firsts this afternoon. They successfully recovered a rogue satellite and one of them used his hands to maneuver it into the shuttle's hold after a mechanical failure. A group of underwriters led by Lloyds sponsored the rescue mission after they paid out £144 million when two satellites went into the wrong orbit earlier this year. One keen observer of events in space was Kristin Fisher, whose mother Anna is one of the shuttle crew. Up above, astronaut Joe Allen tested his jetpack in the cargo bay with a contraption called the Stinger. This was to be put into the rogue satellite's exhaust. The satellite itself was spinning in a useless orbit only 35 feet away. It was nearly the end of a one and a half million mile space chase. With the right light conditions, Alan went to recover the satellite. You can see its reflections over astronaut Dale Gardner. 200 miles below is California and the Pacific. Just to the west of Baja, California. Astronaut Allen manoeuvred into position behind the satellite. He was transformed into a brilliant white blob by the sunlight. Then the stinger went in. Dot, 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 dot. Using his jetpack, Allen halted the satellite's rotation and began to steer it towards the shuttle. Discovery's robot arm groped towards the stinger to lock on and guide it into the cargo bay, but things then went wrong. The robot arm didn't connect properly and only prodded the satellite towards Discovery. The astronaut switched to a backup plan. Man replaced machine. Okay. 
Joe Allen took the place of the arm and did hang on to the satellite, even manoeuvring it, while Dale Gardner tried to fit an adapter which would latch it into the cargo hold. In the weightlessness of space, Allen actually kept firm hold of the half-ton satellite for a complete orbit of Earth, yet another space first. After five hours, the two men tied the satellite down. The recovery mission over, Dale Gardner could... ...orbit since February. On Monday, they successfully retrieved its sister satellite, Palapa. Jeremy Hans has been watching the latest pictures from space. At the moment, the astronauts are manoeuvring their way towards the second and last of their two major recovery missions. This satellite, the Westar, was stranded in a useless orbit earlier on when it was launched in February. And now Dale Gardner, with his probe attached to his space chute, is moving out towards the satellite, as we see. The satellite has been brought to within 30 feet of discovery. And before an hour or so is up, we think that this will be back on its way into the discovery cargo hold. New moves today in the controversy over whether doctors Dramatic pictures from space of an historic satellite rescue. Hello, astronauts aboard the American Space Shuttle Discovery are putting the final touches to the world's first ever rescue mission in space. So far on this voyage, they successfully recaptured two stranded satellites. On Monday, they caught the Palapa satellite, and now a second called Westar is being stowed away into the safety of Discovery's cargo bay. The two communication satellites cost a total of 58 million pounds, but they misfired into the wrong orbits when they were launched nine months ago and couldn't be used. Soon, they'll be brought back to Earth where any damage can be repaired. They can then be relaunched into space and used successfully. We've just received dramatic pictures showing today's recovery of Westar. It was caught by a harpoon-like machine, which is driven by astronaut Dale Gardner. Our space editor, Reg Tennell, reports now from Cape Canaveral. This time we saw Dale Gardner firing his hand thrusters, lining up with Westar and driving home the harpoon. Joe Allen, standing on the tip of the robot arm, was pushed out by Anna Fisher, who was unseen on the flight deck, so that he could grab hold of Westar. But then, like playing a fish, Anna pulled them all to the safety of the cargo bay. And after that, there was another two hours of strenuous work, stowing Westar safely beside Palapa, which was recovered two days ago. And Discovery will bring its, uh, its precious salvage, 58 million pounds worth, back here to the Cape on Friday. Already, NASA is planning to repair and relaunch the first salvage satellite next year. And another thrilling adventure in the skies has just ended. First it satellite on Monday. And at Lloyd's of London, the underwriters rang the lutein bell twice to signal the successful salvage which they'd financed. James Wilkinson reports. The rescue went like clockwork. This time, Dale Gardner strapped on the six-foot so-called stinger and went over to plug it into the slowly spinning satellite. Hey, cargo, they got it. Two days ago, the astronauts succeeded in manhandling a similar satellite into the payload bay, even though that wasn't how they'd planned to do it. It went so well then, they decided on a similar approach today, this time with a little help from the remote-controlled arm. Joe Allen stood on the end of the arm and held the satellite, while Gardner worked on the other end. The rescue was finished an hour ahead of schedule. Both the satellites are now safely locked in position in the payload bay, ready for return to Earth. The insurers, Lloyds of London, originally paid out over 100 million pounds when the satellites went into the wrong orbit in February. Insurance underwriter Stephen Merritt, who paid for the rescue, is now confident that his money was well spent. He watched the rescue from the space center in Houston. When the satellites are refurbished, they'll be sold and the insurers will get much of their money back. To celebrate the success at Lloyd's today, the Lutein bell was rung twice, signifying a successful salvage. The rescue was a remarkable achievement. 
The astronauts will get a hero's welcome when they return to Earth on Friday. Report from our science correspondent, James Wilkinson. Well, in a few moments, the teenage girl who's spoken today for the first time... Cargo Bay. They've now rescued two satellites that were drifting uselessly in orbit since their rockets malfunctioned on launch and landed insurers in London with a multi-million pound claim. News of the recovery was greeted with cheers at Mission Control in Texas and at Lloyd's of London. The insurers hoped to be able to sell the recovered satellites and recoup some of the money they had to pay out. The space shuttle was manoeuvred into place with a series of short rocket bursts that allowed the rescue vehicle to overtake the spinning West Star satellite. On Monday, Discovery had successfully completed a similar rescue operation on West Star's sister satellite, Palapa. Spacewalkers Joseph Allen and Dale Gardner were wearing $2 million spacesuits and using a jet-propelled backpack and a high-technology grappling iron. Slowly, Dale Gardner made for the rogue satellite. West Star was in a useless low orbit, but he managed to grab the cylindrical satellite and drag it back into the shuttle's cargo hold. Now, West Star and Palapa will be brought back to Earth to become the first reusable satellites in space. For the insurance underwriters, it all adds up to a spot of very good news. Lloyds of London and insurers in America stood to pay out $180 million to the owners of the two satellites. Now they hope to recoup some of that money. And this evening, at Lloyds, they were ringing the lutine bell. It's usually rung twice for good news. Tonight, they thought the news was good. And now economic and more business news. Figures out today. The crew of America's space shuttle Discovery have scored a double success by retrieving the second of two communication satellites which had failed to get into proper orbit. James Wilkinson reports. The rescue went like clockwork. This time, Dale Gardner strapped on the six-foot so-called Stinger and went over to plug it into the slowly spinning satellite. He caught it first go. Hey, Tidal, I got it. Two days ago, the astronauts manhandled a similar satellite into the payload bay, even though that wasn't how they'd planned to do it. It went so well then, they decided on a similar approach today. Joe Allen stood on the end of the remote-controlled arm and held the satellite, while Gardner worked on the other end. Both the satellites are now safely locked in position in the payload bay, ready for return to Earth. The insurers, Lloyds of London, originally paid out over £100 million when the satellites went into the wrong orbit in February. Today, Lloyds celebrated the successful salvage by ringing the lutine bell. The rescue was a remarkable achievement. The astronauts will get a hero's welcome when they return to Earth on Friday. All four home football sides. Moment when the news came through on Telex, the Lloyd's chairman immediately announced silver merit medals for the astronauts. And the 18th century Lloyd's Lutine Bell, most well known for its ceremonial one ring when a vessel is lost at sea, was used to announce the spaceship's successful mission. Two rings for good news. Discovery will bring the satellites back to Earth on Friday. Then Lloyds will be looking for buyers in the world's first used satellite sale. In Afghanistan, the guerrillas strike and the Soviet MiGs hit back in revenge. A report next. Well, Alan's turn, seen here using a spanner to fly out tomorrow and capture the second satellite. Mission Control has just decided that yesterday's emergency procedure with the spacewalkers manhandling the satellite will have to be repeated tomorrow. Dangerous though it is, since once it starts moving, it's hard to stop and could easily crash into something. Joe didn't want to go through all this a second time, but has been told he must. More shuttle and news round about the same time tomorrow. Till then, bye bye. <laughs> In a few... Giving the first account of her sudden return to the Soviet Union, completes its three million mile flight around the Earth with a precision landing. The voyage has been rated a complete success with the first salvage operation in space. The astronauts brought back two expensive satellites which failed to go into their correct orbit when they were launched last February. 
a loyalist recovery is safely back to Earth, making a perfect landing in Florida at dawn. Two rogue satellites were rescued during the successful two and a half million mile journey and another two launched. The next flight, scheduled for January, will lift a secret Air Force satellite into orbit.